I think it's worth me interrupting at this point to make it clear to the people listening to this discussion that as an approach which is adopted to absolutely everything which Aristotle did, um, this makes it possible for us to describe, as it were, the whole of reality or the whole of any given reality. That is to say that you, you first of all, you pick out something, anything. Um, it can be a dog, a table, a person, any material object, anything you like. You identify something and then you say something about it. You either attribute characteristics to it or you describe it as doing something or describe it as having something done to it. So these, this double-barreled approach that you identify a subject and then you predicate something of it, this subject-predicate approach has been believed by thinkers ever since to be an approach that makes possible the description of everything, the description of the whole world. In fact, it's become built into our language and our logic, hasn't it? Yes, but I think here what Aristotle wants to insist on is that not all predicates are on the same level, that there are some which simply are predicated of a subject that we've already picked out and identified, but there are these other ones like human being or dog or tree which are fundamental in identifying the subject in the first place. We cannot pick out a bare subject and then tag predicates onto it, but the subject itself has to be identified under some description and it's natural kind terms that play the fundamental role here. But of course we still haven't answered the materialists and we still haven't said in the notion of human being what is the fundamental analysis of human being that will give us the what is it of the subject. So now this is what Aristotle later uh, goes on to do. And this what is it question again applies to everything, doesn't it? I mean it's Aristotle's attempt to actually discover the true nature of the identity of things, of, what, of, of whatever exists, including us. Yes, it is. I think living substances and to some extent also artifacts play a very central role here. And what he wants to now ask is, all right, we've now gotten to the point where we see that notions that we call natural kinds, notions like human being, dog, or statue, say, play a fundamental role in identifying subjects in the world. Now we have to ask more precisely what they are. Are they, is, what it is, is it to be a human being? Is it to be a certain sort of material or is it to be a certain structure? And in the metaphysics, he argues that what a substance is, is fundamentally not some material stuffs or constituents, but it fundamentally is a certain sort of order or structure, which he calls a form. Now, by that, he doesn't mean simply shape or configuration, but he means, in the case of, say, Brian McGee, the way you're organized to function. Your form is an organized set of functional capabilities that you've got to have so long as you're in existence. Now he gives us three reasons for thinking that your materials couldn't be what it is to be you. Now first of all in the case of you and other living things matter is always going in and out, it's always changing and of course you do change your material constituents uh, very very often without ceasing to be yourself. But second, even if that's not the case, say t with an artifact, we our conception of an artifact is that so long as its functional structure remains the same, we could always replace bits of the matter without having a different thing on our hands. We could take a ship and replace some of its planks. So long as it remained that functional structure, serving the function of a ship, we would still have the same entity on our hands. Finally, he argues that matter is just not definite enough to be what a thing really is. Matter is just a lump or heap of stuff. And so we couldn't say you are some stuff or other, but it's only when we've identified the structure that the stuff constitutes that we can even go on to say something intelligent about the stuff itself. Let me just go over those again, because I think they're fun arguments of a very fundamental kind. He says, first of all, Socrates, I think the actual example he takes is Socrates, isn't mm -hmm. it? Socrates cannot consist of, of the matter that goes to make up his body because this matter is constantly changing and in fact changes completely several times in the course of Socrates' life, but he's still the same Socrates throughout mm -hmm. that life, so he can't just be the matter of which he consists. Mm -hmm. But secondly, uh, this applies to species as a whole. A dog can't just be a dog in virtue of the matter of which it consists, mm -hmm. because different, uh, different dogs are different. I mean, some are, some are brown, some are black, some are white. They're different colors, different shapes, different sizes, different weights, but they're all dogs. So they can't be dogs in virtue of the matter of which they consist. And thirdly, um, uh, just a heap of matter without any abstract qualities such as organization or structure or form 
isn't a dog or a person or a shoe or a house or anything. It is just a heap. And that anything can only be anything at all by virtue of its structure, its mm -hmm. form, its function. Is that right? Yeah, that, well, you, you, your second one adds a further argument, actually, that I didn't mention. Uh, yes, the, the different species members are all, of course, differently constituted materially. That would be one further reason yeah. for rejecting the idea that matter gives us a perfectly general account of what it is to be a member of that species. But then I want to add the further point that even when the matter, in fact, doesn't vary, still our conception of what it is to be a certain sort of thing, say, a ship, doesn't identify it with the matter, and we can see that by performing a thought experiment that says if you replace the material bits just so long as you have continuity of functional structure, then you still have the same thing on your hands. But now, isn't this bringing Aristotle dangerously close to Plato's theory of forms, which he's rejected? Because isn't he now saying a dog isn't a dog by virtue of the matter of which it consists? It's a dog by virtue of its dogness. It's, it's abstract dogness. Isn't he in that position or dangerously close to it? Well, of course, here we get to a very difficult area about what exactly form is, and I think no two philosophers are going to be in precise agreement about the interpretation on this. But let me try to say what I think. Now, I think, first of all, it's quite clear that, unlike Plato, he makes the form something imminent to the particular. It does not exist apart from that particular perceptible dog in some do heavenly realm of dogness, but it's just there, it's what the dog, in fact, is. It's not separate from the dog. In other words, it's dog. not an otherworldly right. spirit. Right. right. It it's, it's right yeah. there. It's what the dog really is. It is that dog. Now, the second thing, I believe that the Aristotelian forms are individuals. That is, they're particulars and not universals. That is to say, even though the definition of the doggy form of each dog, if I take five dogs, I'm going to get only one definition of what it is to be a dog for all of them. Still, if I ask how many examples of doggy form do I have here, well, the answer is the number is five. I mean, just mm. as many dogs as there are. Each one, although quite like in quality, will be exactly one in number, as he puts it. That would be, uh, we count forms by counting the number of substances that we have on our hands. I must say, it seems to me, even sort of getting on for 3,000 years later, that these arguments against materialism are devastating. Do you think that Aristotle has effectively ever, ever been answered by materialist philosophers? No, I don't think he has. And I think what I find so powerful about these arguments is that he starts arguing against materialism not only within the context of philosophy of mind and not only by picking out some special characteristics of the mental which make it different from everything else, but precisely here by developing these general theories of identity and substance which show why, for things quite generally, including artifacts, material reductionism is not a good way to go.